was some, one of the design parameters uh, drove a small footprint because there wasn't much uh, space at the corner, so they built the station on the second floor and had a few uh, parking spots for the vehicles for people to load. Uh, this, they had much more area to work with and to drive down costs, they chose to run the vehicles down to the bottom floor so they wouldn't have to build uh, a structure with an elevator and uh, uh, additional utilities. Here, this is just another example of the Carmichael Gym of the station they put together. Uh, for the me mechanical engineering team that I was working with, we've been uh, started out with basically no requirements in terms of uh, items on paper as to how exactly to build it. Evolved over the course of the semester, have a uh, CAD model for a frame, ordered steel, looking at welding the uh, frame this week, identified the specific motors, tires, servos, uh, actuators for autonomous braking and steering and uh, driving. And just at this point, getting together uh, so that we'll have a working vehicle, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, ADA accessibility has always been an important point. Uh, this is probably kind of a limiting factor in how you want to, uh, how you can narrow the vehicle. Um, you have some requirements with ADA as to how wide a, a space can be for a, a wheelchair to successfully navigate. So we had students um, look into that to find out what's a reasonable width. Um, and it certainly seems very feasible to, that 36 inches uh, works well in this scenario. Uh, and Travis Fritz, the same student, put together a brief video to see, show how a wheelchair could possibly enter a vehicle like this. The, uh, so we have, uh, we've had students look at doing a, an analysis on the corridor, building a prototype vehicle. Uh, the next step is looking at possible test tracks on, on, at NCSU. It should be noted that in the U.S., um, the only real PRT system is um, Morgantown, West Virginia. There are no other test tracks that are out there in the U.S. They're out there in the world, but just not in the U.S. This is an opportunity if we could put a test track in NC State. Uh, to really, you know, put our name on the map here. The, the advantage of Eco PRT is because of its size and low cost, putting down a temporary test track that I would say you could build out of wood uh, would also be low cost in itself. Uh, you know, there's the advantages of multiple benefits once you start reducing size and weight to uh, putting down infrastructure costs. This is an example of a quarter mile test track, you know, the uh, rectangle identify the vehicle to give you some perspective on size. Simulations. Um, as Marshall alluded to, when we show this to people, you know, one of the big comments are, well, that's all well and good, but, you know, it can't really handle the capacity that some other systems can. Um, and if you design the system right, in many cases, it actually can um, through multiple means. And, uh, this is a, a picture of a simulation we did at NC State, but we've done simulations at RTP, North Hills, Raleigh in general. Uh, students in civil engineering have also run a variety of simulations. We kind of have a homebrew uh, software we developed to show visually how vehicles could navigate you know, for any simulation in general. This is NC State uh, satellite image with the, uh, with the guideway overlapped on it. This is a close-up of the station with people getting on the station, getting in a vehicle and going. The other um, ish, uh, concern we've had is um, crush loads. So at NC State, you know, there are certain points where students get out of class and they all want to use the system at once. How could you design a, a, a PRT system to handle that load even though they're relatively small vehicles? So, on um, that Pump Library, they have a, a classroom that holds 400 people, and the scenario was, well, if they all helped out and took PRT, could they, the PRT system actually handle it? Uh, so given a, a modest size for a station, you, this simulation shows how you know, 400 people could more or less be cleared out of the Hunt Library area in 10 minutes. It's like watching little ants. <laughs> How are the vehicles powered? Um, 
We'll get to that in one second, and I'll answer that question. So, final thoughts? So we've presented to you a new way to think about transportation in the RTP area. And we have done quite a bit of work on it. We have gotten quite a few comments from a variety of folks. So just a few final thoughts. Um, we would love to have more people get involved. So if you would like to tell us we're crazy, you can do that. That's a way of asking for feedback. It would be great for you to tell us we're crazy because the system improves through feedback. It has improved quite a bit since we started. Uh, you're welcome to join us. If there is a way you could contribute, we'd be happy to grow the size of our think tank. If you know of sympathetic government agencies and you like the idea, we would love for you to talk to the government agencies about us and perhaps connect us to those uh, government agencies because we're only two people. Any connectivity you could provide would be fantastic. If you would like to donate to the effort at NC State, we have a way to do that and we'd be happy to show you uh, how to make donations through the uh, university. In conclusion, there are limited options and capabilities with existing transit options. We've tried to address those with EcoPRT. Automation is coming, but it needs to be done in the right guideway uh, system or it's not going to work. And we believe that super low cost guideway is a key enabler for this. EcoPRT is a low cost way of thinking about non-subsidized transit in the area. We do have a website, ecoprt.com, which we'd love to have you visit. That's 35 minutes. Special thanks to Joe, Natalie, RTA, all of y'all, and the students who have worked with us this semester to bring parts of this to reality. Thank you so much. I was going to say, uh, I was just going to comment from somebody who likes keeping presentations moving, having that thing click and say, time's up right when you're finishing your very last slide. That was very well done, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few moments for questions. You heard the first one about the power. We'll go through that. You have a five minutes or so for questions. Start with that. Um, uh, in the design process, we've explored both options of onboard battery power and power by rail. and we're keeping that option relatively open right now uh, as we develop, um, as we further estimate the cost. But um, I believe both scenarios are possible at a low price point like this. A lot of people we talk to talk or like the power in the guideway idea because batteries, you have to recharge the vehicles, they can run out of power. So uh, many of the people we talk to encourage us to move toward power in the guideway. Yes. Do you see a distance limit for this kind of PRT? I mean, could you do PRT over know, 15 miles or so? And if you've done simulations like that, do you see any issues with going that long of a distance? The, the uh, design criteria we set up initially was designing having a vehicle be low weight and up to a speed of 60 miles per hour. Our prototype obviously isn't going to reach that point, but I don't see any inherent restrictions towards evolving a system to get to that point. And when you're up to 60 miles per hour, the idea of going um, 15 miles is not a big deal. And that uh, slides into the discussion of, well, how do you power the system onboard batteries or, or rail? You know, having it on rail has the opportunity to um, not worry about the battery depleting so you can go effectively as long as you need to. And when we think about distances like that, we think about building different seed systems and circulators. So like one at RTP, one at the airport, one on NC State campus, one on Duke campus, one at UNC, one at the fairgrounds, say, one downtown Raleigh, and then interconnecting those circulators with track that can pick up people along the way as well. So those interconnection routes would have these kind of longer transit distances. What type of fleet size per mile are you talking about? You, uh, that falls out in doing the simulations, and it really depends on what sort of requirements you have. Like an example, uh, the system they're looking at in NC State is two miles long, and they're looking at having 200 vehicles. 
one or two more here, one back there. Would you be um, interested, I didn't see this in your, in your last slide, would you be interested in like, speaking opportunities about this? We would be ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> So we have lots of different thoughts on FAIR, but to address your particular point, it's key that from a user's standpoint, it mm -hmm. looks like just one system. Right. So we could potentially, for example, charge by the mile. You're going three miles, we charge you $1.50. And then we take that money and part of that flows to whoever funded the track along the segments that you rode and, and reimburse the the folks who funded development in that way. So it would be a universal payment system that hides all of that complexity from the right. In the back. Just curious, um, got to the point of looking at this system and, and the lightweight support and, and low cost. As far as ge geometric limitations like grade and going up in the curves of 60 mile an hour, you know, there's a lot of lateral forces that sure. are super elevated so passengers don't get around and that all seems, seems to, have, and to drive up costs, especially if you're having these things coming every two seconds. Kind of like right. Well, one of the nice things about automation is that you can know what's coming up on the track and you can adjust your speed. So if there's a curve, you adjust your speed accordingly. But if you are having a 15-mile a segment that connects Raleigh to the airport, you would design that without a lot of curves in it if you're planning to go 60 miles an hour. Um, you would be the same as designing a, a interstate highway versus designing a residential street. You kind of design it based on the kind of traffic that's going to be running on uh, To comment also, um, we haven't reached that level of uh, design looking at uh, you know, 60 mile per hour uh, analysis of 60 mile per hour guide weight over 15 miles. And we have looked at it on a, on a simpler basis with lower speeds. Um, so that would be a great area for us to explore. On campus, it would likely run at 25 miles an hour, for example. Are you saying 16 or 60? 60. 60. Six zero. Six, thank you. Yes. Two more. Don't you have to have two guide weight systems so that you can, I mean, if you, I'm going to the airport, I also have to come right. back from so yeah. you have to have two side-by-side -side systems? How do you do that? Well, you could have them. Either, I think some of the pictures show on um, side-by-side. Uh, you could either have it side-by-side -side, or you could have them on top of each other. Or as some circulators have done, you run them in a circle. Um, although you wouldn't do that for the long runs. So here you have side-by-side -side guideway. Okay. And that would be the simplest conceivable solution for that kind of thing. So you could consider a, a, a typical guideway length of it being about four feet. So side by side, you're talking about eight feet. One on top of the other, you still have the four feet, but it's stacked um, maybe on the order of 12 feet. It's also possible to, to think of Raleigh as loops. So you might have a single track that runs by here in one direction, but it's able to loop back. So in congested, like high density areas like campus or here, um, designing single tracks that are able to loop back on each other is another uh, option for lowering cost. Time for one more? Okay, yeah. Go ahead, Will. Do you give any thought to the heating and cooling for your vehicle's passenger comfort? Uh, yeah, so HVAC can be a significant energy consumer, and that's another argument against being battery powered. Um, you know, it's not surprising if, you know, just guessing off the cuff, some of the students looked at 
you know, 25 pound units that you'd have to install the system. You know, maybe one kilowatt of power wouldn't be uh, surprising to heat or cool the system on an extremely rough day. These, these gentlemen will be here to speak with us at the end of it. Let's give them a round of applause again. <laughs> Now, let us take us to the other innovation, and these are urban gondola lifts. Let's see if this will work. So, Kyle, if you can hear me, if you will unmute, and we will allow, we will then transfer the desktop to you. Let's be briefly do this. You have, I'll introduce you Kyle and you're good to go. Our next presenter is Mr. Kyle Griffith. He's, he is with, and remind me the name of your firm so I give the exact right, Great Western Pacific, is that right? Yes. Right. So Great Western Pacific, uh, developer in Seattle. His father is also a developer in Seattle, so it's a family legacy there. They have developed and just opened something called the Great Wheel which would be a waterfront Ferris wheel. And you might say, what does it have to do with transit? You'll find out there is a relationship. And he's now proposed, or his family has proposed, a urban gondola lift for Seattle. Everyone here in Raleigh, please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. But we're about to mute Great. ourselves. And this will be the last you'll hear from us. We're going to mute ourselves with voice feedback. But we can hear you. Super. And just wave at me at this video. I'm going to try to show this. Uh, I thought it'd be helpful to give a little kind of context to the area. If the sound doesn't come through, just wave at me and I can turn it off, too. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, um, our family has been in Seattle. And, and uh, the video I'm going to show you is our our project that we, we just built about almost two years ago now uh, that um, goes in a bigger context of a changing waterfront. Uh, we have a freeway that is an elevated freeway that you'll see in this video that is going to be torn down in the next two years. Uh, right now we're building the largest deep water tunnel in the world underneath this elevated freeway and the, the vehicle traffic is going to be diverted in a deep bore tunnel and they're going to redevelop the whole waterfront and uh, this freeway really makes a wall between us and the uh, rest of the city. So here comes the video. Very 
enjoying the, you know, going out with you and, and, uh, and you. <laughs> But the rock isn't just about seeing great views and having a good time. There's a serious side to this new attraction. It's something to lots of people that you've never tried to turn in, which has been hurting with all of their construction programs. I think it's really important to us that the group of men and Dr. Watson's kids are pretty protective because the physical side of the method is not a city event. This is something that's just called the city event. This is not just good for us, it's good for the city event, but it's also a draw for a lot of time. Well, I think we're hearing from uh, a lot of visitors. Okay, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm so short on time here, I'll cut that short, but that gives you a flavor of the area, and um, here's another picture you can kind of see the area. And uh, we're proposing the uh, gondola, let me go to full screen here. Um, we're proposing the gondola uh, really first and foremost to deal with the construction uh, that we're facing here with the the viaduct project we're also building our seawall and there's a whole other presentation on this stuff but uh, we're losing all of our parking and the access and the roads are being uh, really uh, you know changed and so we're trying to get creative to figure out how do we keep people coming to the waterfront? We had 4 million visitors to the Seattle waterfront last year, and uh, that was up substantially after we built the wheel, and uh, we, want to, we want to keep more people coming. Um, so we've, we've proposed some solutions to try to deal with uh, adding more parking, building parking structures, uh, and then the gondola is really you know what uh, I'm here to talk about today. Um, we're excited about the the idea of a gondola connecting the waterfront to the rest of downtown. Um, we have that double decker freeway, but we also have a very severe elevation change. It's a almost like a cliff, and um, so even when we take the freeway down and we take that wall down we're still gonna have a barrier with the topography in the area. So uh, our family skis a lot. We've grown up on ski lifts and gondolas and the wheel um, uses the same kind of gondolas. They're made in the same factory in Europe as the ski lift uh, gondolas. And that's why I wanted to show you the wheel because you can kind of get a sense of what the gondolas look like. Those are a little bit smaller, um, but uh, uh, urban gondola systems are not uh, new. Uh, they're really around the world. They're just new to North America. Um, ski resorts have gondolas, but urban centers don't as much here. Um, here's a map showing current uh, systems and systems being planned. There's new systems being planned all the time. Here's some photos of some systems around the world. Uh, I think this is Colombia here that built a pretty extensive network. Here's Venezuela. Here's Singapore. Uh, Portland just down the street from us here in Seattle built this tram in 2007. 10 million people have rode this tram and it's been a great thing for the city of Portland and we're, we're studying this and, and showing this as a reason why we should build the Seattle one. The stations can look very urban and modern and can have glass and, and different uh, architectural designs. They don't have to look like a ski lift. The access is incredible. The, every single one of them is ADA. The, the seats can flip up. Uh, bikes, strollers, walkers. Uh, it's great for everybody to get in and out. Um, very high capacity. The uh, Marshall and Seth did a great job talking about the capacity of these systems. Are, they're incredible and this is very similar uh, to what they presented. So. I'll kind of skip over this, but uh, very 
low wait times, uh, you know, very high capacity, uh, reduces uh, vehicle traffic. We have um, we have a lot of great support, uh, including the Port of Seattle for our project because they want to reduce the throughput uh, traffic on the road for their trucks. And um, instead of people circling for parking and gumming up the roads, they could park and take the gondola back and forth. Um, again, this was touched on in the previous presentation, but one of the advantages of, of gondola systems are compared to a bus tunnel or a, a subway or an elevated uh, light rail, the, the uh, infrastructure is, is substantially less and less costly and less disruptive to build. So for us in Seattle, it's a big deal because we can't build a, a light rail, uh, you know, uh, system in this route because it just would be too disruptive. It's a very green thing, uh, taking the cars off the road and reducing the emissions and the greenhouse gases is about the greenest thing we could do. And um, so we're promoting um, the green aspect of, of the gondola as well. Here's a picture of kind of what the new waterfront may look like when it's all done. There's a lot of renderings going on, but you can see the trees are kind of replacing the freeway. There's a new uh, a new surface street there, and there's uh, a new boardwalk, and and um, we're hoping to tie in to that right down Union Street, which is one of the the busiest streets downtown. It's kind of the street. The convention center is on one end. The aquarium and the waterfront and our uh, business is at the other end. Uh, Pike Place Market has 12 million visitors a year. That's just on the uh, on the cliff, uh, kind of bluff looking down. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, art. Uh, there's the Seattle Art Museum and Benaroya Symphony Hall and, and different things in that district in Midtown. Um, so it would connect a lot of things that would connect uh, the hotel core, the retail core, the, the job core, uh, all the residents that live downtown would be walking distance. Uh, it would create the east-west connection that we've never had in this city. It ties into a lot of other forms of transit. Uh, there's a new streetcar being proposed, which is the orange line, and, and we have the ferry and bus systems and other things, and it would mesh into that. And, we would use a, uh, a, a, a transit type card that we would accept that would mesh in with the other forms of transit. And we are a private, we'd be a private run deal, so that there's a little um, creative thinking to tie into the, the government issued transit cards with the private operated system, but we've, we've come up with some good ways on that. Um, Here's just an overview of the route. Uh, it, it's really eight towers and three stations. Um, it would go a total of 10 blocks. And, uh, you know, our system is unique for our, our area. The system could go a lot longer, or uh, most of the systems are longer, but since we're connecting such a dense area, that it, the length isn't really the important thing here. It's, it's really the the cliff that we overcome and then connecting all the other elements that are here. We started with the double column on the left and then we've refined it more to be more minimal and elegant um, and uh, we call this the whalebone uh, column but our architects have done a real good job of, of really trying to make this more small and, and elegant. We've heard from the city and everybody that that's important. So here's some more detail. Uh, the, the gondola would run down the center line of the street above the, the cars, above the metro bus uh, tunnel or bus wires, which I'll show you a picture of. Um, and then there's buildings on either side that would have clearance as well. Here's a rendering of how it would look. This is the convention center on one end of the, the route, and um, this is where we would tie in um, put a station right there. Um, this is just a little farther back showing kind of more of the area. 
Here's the uh, inside of the convention center, this food court, and this whole area is kind of underutilized. They, they could use a lot more foot traffic and people. So they're one of our biggest supporters, the convention center and the, and the tourism folks here in Seattle uh, to try to increase uh, people in, in the city, really. Um, here's how it would look looking down the street. And you can imagine if you're in town for a convention and you are staying at a hotel, you can take a light rail train from the airport to the hotel. We just built that uh, in the last few years. The city built a great light rail connection. And then if, you, if we have this gondola, then you could uh, take this from your hotel down to the waterfront or to a, a Maryland game or all the other things, and you never need a car anymore. Uh, here's um, the mid-station location. Um, this is kind of how we started with a, a station that would tunnel completely over the street, but like the tower, we scaled it back to be more of a minimal and um, smaller footprint. There's also a big advantage that there's a lot of utilities under the street all over the place here being in this very downtown street. So to find a location that was clear of utilities on both sides of the road was a challenge. Um, here's just an overview. We're actually changing the way the street works a little bit and, and uh, we took it from three lanes to two and we widened the sidewalk and we made room for the station that way and the city was was happy with that. They, they wanted that. Um, just some more shots of how it would work. We'd have elevators and escalators to access. Everything would be up on the, the second level there. I'm just kind of flipping through this, but obviously uh, take a lot more time. Or, um, here's a cross section uh, showing uh, a little bit of the, that clip I was talking about. Those structures in black um, are elevator bridge, pedestrian bridges that are being proposed. Uh, they're being proposed by the city.